Welcome to Brain in a Vat. We are joined by our resident philosopher of sci-fi, Travis Timmerman. We're going to be talking about uh, Severance, one of our favorite shows. Go and check it out on Apple TV. Travis, would you like to start by telling us a bit about the show? So I'm just going to go over the premise of Severance, which is so interesting in and of itself. So here's the setup of the show. Imagine that you exist sometime in the near future, and they've developed the technological capability to sever you when you go into work. And what severing amounts to is a discontinuity in your psychological connectedness. So when you go into work, you forget everything about your past, all of the details of your life when you exist in this work environment. And then when you leave your place of work, you forget everything that happened while you're at work and then regain all of your time, all of your memories from before you went to the workplace. And what you get in effect then is two different sort of narrative structures of your life where there's complete psychological continuity between all of the times that you're in the office building and complete psychological continuity between all the times that you're outside of your office building, but no psychological continuity in between those two places. And this raises a host of interesting questions. So one is, and mainly, what does this say about personal identity? Are you one and the same person inside and outside of the workplace? Are you two different people in the same brain? Whether you're two different people, the same person, does this generate certain moral obligations between your work self and your at home self? Uh, is it ethical to do this? Is it prudent to do this? So I want to present a position and I want to push you on your view as well, Travis. So the position I want to present is that it doesn't seem to be the case that the innie, the person who's at work, and the arty, the person who lives out of work, who don't remember each other's lives, it doesn't seem like they are the same person. So I want to make at least that claim. And then I want to say, but it doesn't seem like they're sufficiently continuous with themselves for them to be a coherent person either. It seems to me like there's no person that persists through time, even within the context of the any or the RT. So the any from day to day isn't the any that they were yesterday because there's this big gap. So as they leave the doors, as the any leaves the doors of their job, they suddenly snap out of existence. And some people would say they snap back into existence the next day when they arrive back at work. But that sounds weird to me. How can something snap out of existence and into existence? So I want to say that the person before they were severed into two has ceased to exist. And the any and the RT don't persist through time. What do you think? Do you buy it? Do you buy my line? So I don't know what the correct account of personal identity is. I tried to figure it out while I was watching the show. Couldn't do it. <laughs> but I'll tell you what I think, and then I want to push back on your view a little bit. All right, so I'm inclined to think that personal identity sufficient condition is the continuity of the same physical structure that gives rise to your conscious experience. And that allows for gappy existence. Now, why do I think that? Well, one, cases where somebody goes to sleep, falls into a coma, hits their head and has temporary amnesia, imbibes too much alcohol or drugs, and then there's a gap in their uh, conscious experience. All of those are cases where I think that person that never goes out of existence in the first place. And so when you had Jeff McMahon on, he'd mentioned that Derek Park had briefly forgot that he wrote reasons and persons. And I think on your view, you have to say the original Derek Park had died and a new person came into existence who did not write reasons and persons. But in that case, and all these other cases that are structurally similar, I think it's one and the same person. As for gappy existence, it's admittedly weird when you think about it with respect to persons. But I think that we can have gap existence for inanimate objects. And I don't see an in principle reason to think that inanimate objects and persons are going to be different. So if someone took my phone here and took it apart piece by piece and spread all the pieces out, I would think my phone went out of existence when all of those parts were spread out. Maybe they even mailed parts to all these different places in the world overnight, and then they're overnighted again. And then imagine that they're all put back exactly as they were before. I think my phone went out of existence and it came back into existence once the pieces are put back together. If that can happen for inanimate objects, I don't see why it can happen for 
psychological creatures as well. So just to clarify, is your view that the physical underlying stuff that produces those mental states, those brain states are both necessary and sufficient or just necessary for identity to persist? Well, I want to say what's necessary is that the physical structures that give rise to the conscious experiences persist. And then I think whatever those conscious experiences are, that is going to be one of the same person, whatever conscious experiences are produced. Now that's going to result in a lot of really weird outcomes, but as is the case with really any difficult philosophical experiment, there's no view on offer that doesn't result in any sort of really weird outcome. So the question is, what are the least weird outcomes or what are the most plausible weird outcomes? And this is what I want to tentatively endorse while saying far from certain about what the right view is. So one of the difficulties might be that if you think about what your physical nature was when you were born as a child, you don't share any of the cells with that being. Now, most people want to say that they are continuous with the being that was born. One view might be to say, well, you're not. Once the final cell swaps out, you're dead. And what you really are is a sort of series of overlapping arcs. And you owe your existence to these prior versions of you, but they're not the same as you. And I wonder how you respond to a position like that. I think of identity as like flipping a light switch on and off. You either are the same person or you're not. Uh, over time, I do think that I'm continuous with my a uh, baby self, even though there are no psychological states that are overlapping between my current 36 year old self and my baby self. My earliest memory is right before I was three years old when my sister was born. So everything before that is completely distinct from my memories now. And the actual living cells that were in my body are completely numerically distinct from the ones now, according to Jaguan Kim's uh, book and philosophy of mind that happens gradually, but every seven years. All the living cells that make up your body now are completely distinct from the living cells that made up your body seven years ago. But I do think the physical structure persisted through that time because the change is gradual. So I think there's been the same physical structure that's undergone gradual changes of its parts, but the structure itself has remained the same during this entire time. And that if there were any break in that, then there would be a break in my existence. Now that does raised some very weird questions. So Jeff McMahon has this thought experiment where imagine that I have a degenerative cognitive disease and it can be prevented by replacing a living carbon cell in my brain with a silicon cell. And the doctor says, you can come in and do this every single day. It'll be painful. We'll do it one at a time and it'll be gradual. And then over the course of seven years, all of your uh, carbon cells will be replaced with these silicon cells, but there'll be the same physical structure with the continuity of consciousness the whole time. Or, Hey, I'll tell you what, we can just do it today. I'll just take your brain out and then I'll put in a completely silicon brain that gives rise to qualitatively identical conscious experience. On my view, I would survive if the replacement happened gradually and I would die if they destroyed my brain and then put in the silicon brain all at once, even though the outcome is going to be exactly the same in those two cases. And so I, that's a weird consequence that keeps me up at night, but I do think it's a more plausible consequence than the alternatives. Yeah. So as a good philosopher, you're preempting our objections, which is fantastic <laughs> and not resolving them. So you're just saying, well, here's an objection to my view. And I know that this is a problem. And in saying that, then it's not a problem, <laughs> which is very good <laughs> philosophy, but here's another case. So that's a problem for you. If the very stuff involved isn't important, but the structure is important, suppose that you step into a machine and two Travises step out. They have identical physical structures in their brain, although you shouldn't care which one has the same matter as the one before. They have the same structure and the same sort of stuff making up that structure. How would you? distinguish which one is you and which one isn't you. And you think that identity is one-to-one, -one, so there can only be one answer for you. I think there's a couple of ways you could go with this. One is to say that there's no continuity with the physical structure that uh, made me up before the two identical structures are created, right? So I need the details of the case, but we could fill in the details such that the physical structure of my brain that gives rise to my consciousness 
goes out of existence and two different physical structures come into existence, they give rise to identical conscious states, even if they contain some of the same atoms that make it up. I would think in that case, I doubt. Uh, but maybe you're imagining a case that's like vision case that Parker talks about in Reasons of Persons, which was actually originally proposed by David Wiggins in a 1967 paper, but Harvard's often credited for coming up with it and he just answers it. And what I want to say in those cases is what David Lewis says, which is if you could cut my brain in half and maintain all the same conscious experiences and then put each hemisphere of my brain into a different body, I think there were two people there all along. And I don't realize that there are two people now because they are co-located in space and time and they have introspectively indistinguishable psychological lives. So it'd be very hard, if not impossible to know that there are two people there, but if you could cut it in that way and put it in two different bodies, then I think there are two people there all along. If you could cut it in a whole number of ways that however many ways you could cut it, there's that many people that would have been contained in my skull at that same time, unbeknownst to all of us. So now this really uh, does bring us back to the severance case. Is your view that the innie and the arty were actually two persons co-located within Mark, the protagonist, all along before the severance procedure even happened? No, I don't think that. I think they are one and the same person because it's the same physical structure, the continuity of the brain that's giving rise to that conscious experience that persists throughout the duration of the show. So I think what's really happening is that it's one person who's in very different psychological states, but I don't think psychological continuity is necessary for personal identity to be maintained. So it's just one individual at different times acting in different ways. And they sort of think of themselves as distinct individuals. You have them sort of say things like that throughout the show. So when a doctor is about to perform a severance on Heli, he tells her that he can't wait to meet her. And that seems to suggest that he thinks of her as a different person. Heli, the character who's the one that's severed in the beginning of the show and uh, is managed by Mark, she thinks of her Audi as a different person and she's trying to end her life and get her Audi to know that she's ended her life out of spite. But then other characters think of themselves as the same person. So Dylan, one of the other workers, discovers that he has a child and he thinks of it as his child. He doesn't think, I have an Audi who's in my body and they have a child. He thinks it's my child and I'm being deprived of time with my child. So one of the things that's really great about, I think the writing of the show, just as a tangential point, is that they don't take a stance on what personal identity is supposed to be. They sort of seem to recognize the philosophical issues at the racing, and then they have different characters adopt different perspectives. But my own view is that it's one and the same person, even though there's complete psychological discontinuity. Why do I think that? Well, I'll say one thing about a real life case that I think is similar to severance, but importantly distinct, a sports of you. So there is many listeners may know, a famous punk band called the Sex Pistols and the lead singer, John Lydon, also known as Johnny Rotten, grew up in working class Britain and he got spinal meningitis as a child. And he went into a coma. And when he came out of the coma, the person that came out, I'll phrase it without begging any questions, had complete retrograde amnesia. So the person that came out of the coma after spinal meningitis had no recollection of earlier John Lydon's life for the first seven years of his life. I didn't know who his friends were. He didn't know who his family was. He didn't know who his brothers and sisters were. He had no, no recollection of that. And I think that's the same person that came out as John Lydon before the coma, John Lydon after the coma. And then after, I think four years, those memories came back. So then he remembered all the times from before he was seven. Now, my view is, it's just one and the same person over time. And I don't have to say anything funky about that case, but if you accept a psychological account of personal identity, or if you accept that as a criteria of personal identity, as I think you do, Jason, then you have to say something about that case. And it's not sure what, do you want to say a different person came out of the coma? So there were two people, John Lydon pre-coma, John Lydon post-coma. And then what happens when their memories are fused together? Do they turn into a third person or is it now two people with one psychological perspective? I mean, all of these things seem very weird to me and I can avoid that with my account by just saying it's just one and the same person over time. 
I mean, I agree, my account's going to have some metaphysical weirdness to it, but your account's not going to account for Johnny Lydon's experience. So I can well imagine people would say to him after he worked from the coma before regaining his memories, you're so different to the old Johnny. You, you don't laugh at my jokes anymore. And your character's quite different. You, you've changed a lot. We don't enjoy the, the movies together that we used to enjoy. And even your taste in music is different. You couldn't account for that. Or you'd have to say that it's metaphorical speech when people say to him, well, you're a different person. And he himself might feel resentment at the previous Johnny and how much people like the previous Johnny and not the, the, the subsequent Johnny. I mean, I don't know if any of this is true. I'm just saying, as an example, we can well imagine him feeling resentment towards the old Johnny and a lot of people preferring the old Johnny. And, and it does feel like my position saying that they're distinct individuals would satisfy that intuition. Whereas your position, you'd have to say something like, well, they're thinking metaphorically or they're not fully understanding the metaphysics involved. I mean, yeah, that, that is what I would say, but I don't see that as a bullet fight. So they, they're either not speaking literally or they're mistaken about what personal identity is. And that's fine. Personal identity is really hard. I don't know what personal identity amounts to. And I could imagine him feeling resentment, but that just means there's moral reason to not go on about how a person was better before some horrible, <laughs> some horrible accident really suffered. I mean, here's another real life case. I knew a guy, not very well, but I knew a guy in high school who got in a car crash and he suffered some brain damage from that. And it totally changed his personality. So there was psychological continuity between himself pre-car crash and post-car crash. But then he went from being very reserved and sort of calm and planning everything that he said very carefully to being very outgoing and to being sort of incapable of restraining himself. He just, as a result of the brain damage, would say whatever came to his mind the moment it came to his mind. And his aesthetic taste changed and his friends group changed. And I think that's the same person. They underwent some radical personality change, but they had a continuity of the same physical structure that gave rise to the conscious experience the whole time. And I mean, I wonder what you would say about that case. Would you say, uh, you can't undergo any sort of change in character like that. And it turns into a different person, even though there's psychological continuity, or do you want to say it is the same person. If it is the same person, then it seems like your view is subject to the same sort of issues that you were just raising. From my yeah. I want to say they're different people. I, I, <laughs> I want, I, I want to say there was person pre -car, car crash and person post car crash and they're very different people. Although in my view, memory helps. So if you remember the things that the old person did, that helps. And so there might be a resource there if I want to say they're the same person. Do you think the person that inhabited your, say, seven-year-old body is different than the person now? I'm quite uncertain about that um, because on the one hand, it does seem like there's a series of inter interlocking memories that go all the way back to that seven-year-old. It also seems like if you believe psychoanalysts that the experiences of the seven-year-old inform our behavior today, and so maybe there's that sort of psychological profile link or character link that matters. But on the other hand, it seems like the similarity between me and that seven-year-old is so small compared with the similarity between me and Mark that I seem to be more Mark than that seven-year-old. So I've got a couple of thoughts. The, the one I suppose is there's a looseness in language that people use. So someone will say, you're not the person that I married and therefore I want a divorce. And what do they mean when they say this? The one is they could mean something like Jason means, which is that person uh, who I married no longer exists. They change sufficiently through their behavior or their belief states. And then some clone took over their body and I didn't marry that clone. And so I'm out. Or they mean something else, which is mm, your character traits have changed sufficiently that I no longer feel like I want to be with you anymore. Or this relationship doesn't work anymore because you've shifted in some way, but we still see them as consistent. I mean, you can imagine Johnny Rotten saying, I really wish that I remembered what it was like before I went into the coma. And that seems like a consistent thing for him to say. In other words, he sees himself as one being. And then when he does remember, he says, thank goodness, I've got my memories back, as opposed to going through a series of deaths. It would be interesting as well, if Jason's right, 
we might have to reconceptualize our account of death, which is that people die all the time. There's a body that seems to house these new beings that get birthed all the time once there's sufficient changes. If you go through enough dramatic things, I mean, and Jason takes the view, you drink too much, you die, a clone pops up. If that is the case, and by the way, the first uh, ever existential comics takes this view. It's playing with Parfit's teleporter machine. And there's a guy who refuses to get into the teleporter because he thinks you die. And then he sort of thinks, well, maybe I die all the time. Maybe I die every time that I sleep. And by the time that he physically dies, he says, I don't fear this because it's already happened a thousand times. And so you could take that kind of view and it might change our moral views about death and killing. If we think that people die every couple of weeks, it's not a big deal, but it seems like a dramatic position. Yeah, it does seem very much like a dramatic position. I think what goes wrong with the person in the existential comics is that the change happens gradually when you're not going through teletransport. And when you do go through teletransporter, all of the matter, as Parker describes it, it breaks up and then you get completely numerically distinct atoms that come together. So there is that break in psychological uh, continuity and physical continuity from the physical body that gives rise to the psychological experiences. So I think that teletransporter machine is death and the gradual change is not. And right, if people really are dying all of the time, then a lot of choices that we make seem far less risky. Death would seem far less bad. And things that might seem more or extremely imprudent wouldn't be, especially if we think as most people do, that you don't have an obligation to create happy people. So if it's permissible to refrain from creating a happy person when you could do so, and the future person that would be in your body is just a distinct happy person. Then lots of things that might seem extremely imprudent, say deliberately getting addicted to heroin or something like that, would then perhaps no longer be imprudent. That might be the way to maximize your well being for the short time that you have on this earth. <laughs> and then you know, there's no you know negative consequence from that apart from failing to bring in some other happy people who would have otherwise existed. Okay, so I think there's two important clarifications to make. So the one is that I don't have to take the extreme position of this view, which is that we're dying all the time. So dying every time you take a, a spoon of sugar or get a phone call that makes you a bit excited or orgasm, or you're not going to die each and every time one of those happens. I want to say that there's sufficient continuity between those instances that you survive. So I think people can survive for many years unless they go drinking every weekend, in which case I think they die regularly. So I personally think I've survived for decades at a stretch, although I think Mark dies regularly. I've watched Mark die. I've watched him in ICU. I've watched him perish many times. I've even facilitated by getting him alcohol once or twice. Uh, I think when we first met, I killed Mark off by giving him whiskey for his birthday. But I do <laughs> think that one can persist for quite a while, but death will happen every so often, and it could be beyond your control, just like we think that physical death is beyond your control sometimes. I just think that this happens more frequently than physical death. And by physical death, I mean the cessation of the organism. So heartbeat stopping, something like that, some sort of physical definition of death. And I don't want to be tied to the heartbeat definition because I know that's very contentious. The second thing to note is that you don't have an obligation to bring happy people into the world. But would you agree that when you take heroin, that the subsequent people who do exist will have a really rough time of it? So it seems to me like, especially if we start to think in terms of people dying more often than we usually would, that we would conceptualize morality as pertaining to future instances of the person occupying your body as well as other individuals who don't occupy your body, which we normally think morality pertains to. So don't you think taking some heroin would have negative consequences for those individuals? So with the question about heroin, yes, I think that's exactly right. So the case that I was imagining it was suppose that you know that your death date is coming. You're going to get too inebriated. You're going to do too many drugs on your view where you will go out of existence. So suppose that when that time comes, you do so much heroin that you, let's say, overdose, and there's no one that comes after you. That seems to me to be an imprudent thing to do. I think it's an imprudent thing to do because you're missing out on additional good life, on my view, when you do that. But on your view, it's hard to see how that would be imprudent or immoral if you make sure to do enough so that no new person comes into the body and then has to deal with being a drug addict. 
So you can have a situation, I gather, where it's good for you to take the heroin. You have a good time. You then cease to exist on Jason's account. The new person that's brought into existence is now a heroin junkie. And maybe they get the delight of taking heroin. But the further iterations, once we go like 10 generations down, let's say every time you take heroin, you're dying. That person eventually winds up being a miserable junkie. And so there's some interesting utility calc about that, right? Like we get to make 10 happy users uh, and then we wind up with a series of junkies until there's some physical death. And the question is, as the first person to make the choice to set the chain reaction into, into existence, do I owe any of these other beings anything? Jason's also a utilitarian. So he's going to sort of say, well, I do the calcs and really these things are all just vessels of utility anyway. I mean, you know, it doesn't really matter if they're different people or not. I mean, they're all equal. We're just counting the utils in the air. So whether it's me or 10,000 other beings, doesn't matter one way or the other, really. Yeah. And just by the way, on my view, it's always irrational to take the heroin because Mark, the way you phrase it is I take the heroin and I have a good time, but then I cease to exist. On my view, I don't even have a good time because by the time I'm having a good time, it's not me anymore. <laughs> so, so, so I never get to enjoy the heroin. So it's never rational for me to take the heroin. Yes. Yeah, so on your account, what happens is that basically there's this little being that gets birthed for a short period of time. And that period of time is just like delight and it's great for them. But my point is, it might be that what you have is it's not rational for you, but you're not an ethical egoist. You're a utilitarian. And so if we just count up the, the utils, it might turn out that being a junkie is a great thing to do. Lots of pleasure. Lots of little beings that are going to get pleasure. No, but, but surely not, right? So if it was the case that the number of positive utils outweighed the negative utils, in other words, on the whole, it benefited the series of beings to take the heroin, then it would also be the case that on Travis's view that there's a single person involved, that person benefits from taking the heroin but we think that's false. And so we think that taking heroin is a bad lifestyle decision, right? <laughs> Regardless of the, the metaphysics involved, we think it's a bad idea. <laughs> so, so that's, it's not going to be a problem for my view any more than it is for any other view. Yeah. If your viewers take away one thing from this discussion, don't do heroin. It's imprudent. But <laughs> here's something that I think, I, I don't know where Jason comes down on this as a utilitarian, but I think that persons are the fundamental bearers of value. So when you are assessing or ranking worlds, even on my favorite utilitarian view, and there's a discrepancy between the amount of utiles and the number of happy people, the rankings of the world is determined by the number of happy people. Now, why do I think that? Well, consider two different cases that concern an infinite number of people and an infinite amount of utility. And tell me whether you think one is better than the other. So here's the first case, world of suffering. Imagine that there's an infinite number of people, all of who are going to live infinite lives. And at the first moment in time, they all are happy. At the second moment in time, one of them, the first person, let's say we'll pick one randomly out of the infinite line, then their well being level goes below zero and remains below zero for eternity. So then they have an infinitely bad life. The second moment in time, a second person goes from being happy to the negative well-being level, and then they're negative for all eternity. And that repeats every single moment of time. So now what you have in the world of suffering is that each moment of time, there's a positive amount of infinite utility and a finite amount of negative utility. But everybody in that world lives an infinitely bad life. Contrast that with the world of pleasure, which is the converse version of the case. So everybody starts off below the zero well-being level. And then at the first moment of time, pick one person randomly, they go to the above zero well-being level and they remain positive for eternity. Second moment in time, a second person stops suffering, goes above the zero level, remains positive for all eternity. And then that happens. And in the world of happiness, at each moment in time, there is a finite amount of positive utility and an infinite amount of disutility. But everybody in that world lives an infinitely good life. Whereas in the world of suffering, everyone lives an infinitely bad life. I think the world of pleasure better than the world of suffering. The world of suffering sounds horrible to me. It's right there in the name. The world of pleasure sounds amazing. And what I think the upshot of this is, is that it's persons that are the fundamental bearers of value 
not the utility at times. And if we accept that, then I think we can avoid these counterintuitive cases when we're thinking about finite amounts of utility as well. It's more same amount of utility, but spread out across happy people is better than the same amount of utility where there's lots of people that have lives that are not worth living. Would this be a problem for a utilitarian who does not think that persons are the bearers of utility, but they're a negative utilitarian, or they feel that negative utility or suffering is much more important than positive utility or happiness or pleasure. In other words, they think that when you're doing the calc, you discount positive utility perhaps to zero. You only count the negative utility. That seems to avoid this case. I'm not sure whether you could reformulate the case that it would still be a problem for that position. Yeah, I mean, I think it could avoid the case in versions in which you bring about no sentient life or sentient life where there's a uh, pain. But I don't think it can handle cases when the only options available to you are different amounts uh, of pain. And then if they say persons aren't the fundamental bearers of value, but the utility at times, then they'd want to pick the times that have less pain rather than more. And that can result in worse outcomes for individuals. So I think they can avoid it in a, some subsets of those cases, but they're going to have, they're going to be subject to that problem when the only outcomes are ones that include some disutility. Interesting. I mean, I, I can hear what Simon Blackburn, one of the previous guests on our show would have said, he would have said, well, these kinds of discussions make no sense to me. They're so hypothetical. They're such weird, bizarre worlds that I don't want to permit that kind of discussion, that it's meaningless and it doesn't inform whether morality in our everyday lives pertains. In other words, it, it doesn't inform our account of morality. So he'd want to say that once we're discussing these kinds of very weird hypothetical worlds, he'll disallow the thought experiment. I think that's what the utilitarian needs to do a lot of the time. They need to push you into an incredibly refined version of the thought experiment and then say, hold on, this is now so divorced from everyday life that it doesn't illustrate anything about morality in everyday life. Well, Simon Blackburn is much smarter and more accomplished than me, but he's wrong. If he would say that he's just wrong. I mean, so one thing is there's no reason I think in principle to rule out hypothetical experiences, thought experiments. If they're so far removed from reality that you have a difficult time understanding what's going on, or if they're underspecified, or if they're so bizarre that it messes with our concepts, then I think we should discount our judgments in those cases. But just seemingly being different from reality in and of itself, I don't think should make us discount our judgments. So I was at a conference a few weeks ago and this person who was a friend of mine gave this thought experiment about somebody who had a foot that was completely functional, but was causing chronic pain and she wanted it removed. And one of the people in the audience in the Q and A says, well, that's so unrealistic. How could we possibly make judgments about that case? My friend said, oh no, that's an actual case. And I just gave you all of the details that you read about in the medical journal, but there's no sort of difference in their epistemic state when he told them that this was actualized rather than just merely fiction. But the other thing to say about the infinite cases is I don't know if that's far removed from the real world. So, I mean, I'm not religious. I don't believe in an afterlife, but it's. There's really smart people who do, and I wouldn't be so confident as to assert that's impossible. I think there's good arguments for that. And if there's an afterlife where everybody can have positive infinite utility, then that's an actual case where we're dealing with infinite utilities. Or if the universe is expanding and collapsing, expanding and collapsing, and depending on what the correct account of personal identity is, we are created in perpetuity where it seems from our perspective, like the first time that we're living, but in actuality. It's just the sort of Nietzschean eternal recurrence. But then that's a case where we're dealing with infinite utilities as well. So I think on some plausible views of cosmology, on some viable views about religion in the afterlife, we're going to be dealing with infinite utilities in the actual as well. So even if we have to restrict it to real life cases, I'm not sure that this is so far removed from real life. So I want to return to something we talked about earlier regarding severance seems like there's two different ways of cashing out what's going on with people. The one is that when you get severed, a new being gets birthed. And the other one is to say, no, it's just one being with different facets of them. And you mentioned a situation where Heli tries to commit, I think murder suicide would be the best way of putting it because it's ambiguous what's going on. She 
gets into the elevator. The elevator is the thing that switches you over to any or outie, ties cable around her neck, and the outie basically wakes up and is um, dying. And so there's a sense in which it's either a signal of, if you don't let me out, I'm going to kill you, or it's a genuine attempt at suicide in the innie state because Heli has a horrible time as an innie. And so I wonder if you take the view that suicide is morally permissible, that someone has a right to end their own life. And I'd imagine maybe you take the view if you're depriving yourself of all these wonderful things to go ahead, you're doing something wrong, but maybe that's your ability to kind of wave that future. But it seems like there's something different here where Heli's ending someone else's psychological states. Uh, and it seems like we think it's permissible for her to die. Is it okay for her to die if it has an effect on the outing? Yeah, right. So she seems to think of her Audi as a different person. So even if she is in effect just committing suicide, relative to her belief, she's uh, ending her life and ending the life of her captor. Now, what's sort of, I think, tricky about that case is the audience sees that her Audi had denied her request to, to continue working in that place, right? So the way that the audience, I think, sees the show is that the Audi heli created potentially a new person who's subject to this work life 24-7 uh, without her consent, with, without any sort of break, right? No, even though she leaves the workplace each day, then the Audi heli comes a nuisance from her first person perspective. She never, ever leaves the drudgery of her desk. And for her, that's a fate worse than death. She asked her captor to end her life, which her Audi heli can do without ending the Audi heli's life. And she refused to do so. So you might have sympathy in this case where if somebody creates you and then kidnaps you and forces you to live a life that's not worth living, and then they could free you without killing themselves and they choose not to. And the only way to escape that is to kill you and kill them, you might think, then that's permissible. I think there's a deontological prohibition against murdering an innocent person, even if it's going to maximize utility, which I suspect that you do, Mark. Then if you think that the person that created you is not blameworthy for creating you, they're not holding you captive, right? They're not getting the information that your life is a constant hell and you prefer to not exist than to exist. But I think on your view, you'd have to say it would be wrong to do that. You'd be, you could potentially be doomed to a life of eternal suffering rather than permissibly, rather than being able to end it and end the life of someone else. Whereas I think Jason and I can say, well, it depends on the details of the case. How bad is the life and work? How good is the life of the person outside? How much good you be depriving them of? It's going to be highly context sensitive. There can be some cases that I think the utilitarian is going to be able to capture intuitively where it's permissible to end your life, even if it means someone else dies as a result. And there's going to be cases where I think it's going to be impermissible to do that. And you would be having to make some sort of sacrifice for the good enough person, but it's all going to depend. But I take it on your view, you have to say, oh, it's wrong. There's just the deontological prohibition against killing an innocent person, even if it's going to be best for you and not too bad for them. I mean, it raises an interesting second case. So Bert, um, the arty Bert decides to retire. And this necessarily means that any Bert will cease to exist. And I think there we say, well, retiring must be a choice that you can make. That it seems that he's retiring from work because he wants to move cities, that his partner in the arty world and him want to go somewhere else. And this will mean the end of any Bert. And this is kind of accompanied by an exit ceremony. There's a strange kind of communication from the arty Bert saying, I hope that you guys all had a good time knowing this other version of me, and I don't know any of you, but so long and thanks for all the fish. And there's something interesting about this because I don't think we have a negative moral judgment about Bert's decision here, but it does seem if you take the two person view to basically result in someone's death. Yeah, it does. And if it is two people, it seems like it's a very weighty decision to not retire. Now. In effect, the person is going to die at some point in time and every day that you don't go into the workplace is a day that you're depriving them of additional life. So even calling in sick, which Mark does at one point in the show, is in effect taking a day out of the life of this other person. 
So there's going to be this one-to-one -one correspondence. So it's not only can you kill them by retiring, but every single moment you're not spending the office and getting some life for yourself, you're taking away some life. And that raises these questions about what the trade-off should be. Now, on my view, the extent to which your death is bad for you is the extent to which you miss out on possible good life. So the earlier you retire, the more life you're depriving someone of, the worse death is going to be for them. I think you just have to do what's going to maximize the good if they're in fact two distinct people. And you can be obligated to sacrifice your life if the good that the other person is going to get is even greater. I think in actuality, the way that it's portrayed in Severance, life outside of Lumen is much better than life inside Lumen so that it would be permissible to retire even if you're really prematurely ending the life of this other person. But if you think there's a deontic prohibition against killing and you're not paying attention to the quality of life that's at stake, then I think that raises difficult issues for people that identify as standard deontologists. Now, one sort of interesting issue that this raises too, that uh, you alluded to, Mark, is if you think there's a distinction between killing and letting die, you might wonder if there's a moral difference between the time at which you choose to retire. And so once you're in Audi, your any has already gone out of existence. So if you choose to retire at that point, you're in effect, just not bringing them back into existence. Is that choosing to kill someone or is it choosing to just fail to revive a person who maybe hasn't died, but who has ceased to exist? And is there a morally relevant distinction between killing someone and failing to revive someone? who's already gone out of existence. If you think so, then maybe retiring doesn't seem so problematic. But if you think that there isn't a difference between those two cases, then more complicated philosophical issues arise. What's very interesting is that the utilitarian can kind of get away with the view that it doesn't matter what the metaphysics involved is. What matters is overall utility. So it doesn't matter whether there's one person or two here. What matters is overall combined quality of life. And so if retirement is going to on the net balance, improve quality of life, then retirement is good. But the deontologist says the metaphysical question is absolutely crucial because you have to protect life. And so if there's a second person and you're not that person, you're making a decision that kills that person. If you're the arty that's going to kill the innie, then that's a huge problem. Am I getting that right? I think you're getting it largely right. Uh, it might come, there can be a difference with respect to what sorts of reactive attitudes we have towards individual actions. So if it is one and the same person, you might think that you're just doing something that's imprudent, perhaps. If you're severing, at least in the fictional world of severance where Lumen is, spoiler alert, like not a great company, they're clearly doing something suspicious, they're lying to people, they're harming them. So it might be imprudent. But if it is in fact a different person, even if the difference in utility is the same, you might be wronging an individual and then subject to moral blame in a way that you're not, if it's just something that you're doing to yourself. But Jeff Sebo has a paper where he imagines like a nighttime and a daytime version of a person who want to live very different lives. And even if they're the same person, he thinks the fact that they're so distinct means that you're in a position of justice with respect to them. So maybe. Even if it is the same individual, you might want to have different reactive attitudes to the any and outy version of yourself, even beyond just saying that you've done something that's bad for you. You've done something that's bad for a version of you that's quite distinct, and that might generate something like agent regret in William Sutz. One other case where it could be different is a wacky infinite case that is not like the real world so, to go to the same before, but if persons are the fundamental bearers of value in a world with more happy people, rather than fewer is better. If you accept that version of utilitarianism, like I do, then you do get a weird case. If you imagine like one infinitely existing being where every moment of time is happy and suppose that they could sever and, if, and suppose that severing results in two people. Now you've created two beings that have infinite utility and that's going to be better than one. And then they could sever again. And then if they each sever, you'll get four. And then if they sever again, you'll get eight. So if you have a case with one infinitely existing being where every moment of time they would exist would be a happy one. And time is infinitely divisible and severance brings about a new individual. Then what you would be obligated to do as a utilitarian is to just keep severing over and over again, uh, to make the world better. But in the world, I think in the world of severance, in the TV show, I think you're spot on Jason. So do you think that the person who makes the choice to sever and Mark does it for an interesting reason. So for him, 
he's in agony. Uh, he's mourning the death of his wife. And so he wants respite from this, and that's why he wants to sever. He wants uh, some time when he's not living with this turmoil. I suppose he doesn't know what life's like in the workplace, but in some senses, workplace Mark is quite happy. He has a purpose. He's a manager. Uh, he guides people through this process of emerging as a new being. Does R.T. Mark do something wrong by getting severed? Now, there's another character who gets severed for her births. She thinks that the process of giving birth will be very painful and so wants to basically have that experience by someone else. And we might think of a, another kind of analogy there, which is someone who takes a very strong sedative. Jason told me a story about, I think it's his grandmother, and he went to go visit her in hospital and she was kicking and screaming in pain. And he said to the doctor, you need to do something. They said, oh, don't worry. We give them this medication um, and they never remember any of the stuff that they've gone through right now. So don't worry, it's fine. And his view was, it's not fine. The being that's present now seems to be in a lot of agony. It doesn't matter that my, when my grandmother wakes up, she won't remember any of this. And so it seems like there's some interesting real life parallels of these outputtings that people do where they want to shelve the unpleasant parts of their life to some other state, like, you know, a state where you're on drugs or to some other kind of being or some other part of your psyche. Yeah, excellent. Right. So one of the first shots that we see of Mark is him crying in his car outside of Lumen, just mourning the death of his uh, wife. So I think relative is evidence and in actuality, severing is morally permissible for him because it's either him where he will get eight hours a day, five days a week, where he doesn't recall his wife and he's much happier. Or it's a different person. And I think relative to his evidence, he believes that different person would have a life that's on the whole good. And it looks like in actuality in the show, that's true of workplace Mark as well. Even if he comes to believe that Lumen has done something bad and has tried to take them down. And even if that ends his life prematurely, overall, his life looks like it is worth living. Now, the case of the a woman who severs for pregnancy is interesting because if that is in fact a different person, the life while you're pregnant probably is on the whole still good for you, even if the birthing process is quite painful. But you can imagine variations of that case where the time that you sever is a time that would be so bad that it'd be worse than non-existence at all. And if you're creating a new person, that what you're doing is causing a person to exist, to live a life that's not worth living so you don't have to suffer that pain. And that does seem wrong. And it would, I'd even want to say it'd be wrong in my sort of favored utilitarian, like consequentialist view where persons are the fundamental barriers of value. Because now, instead of having one person that had a life that was worth living, you have one person that has a slightly better life and an additional person that has a life that's not worth living. That seems like a worse world to me, even if the overall utility is the same. Now, the, it, there are real analog cases like that. I'm really sorry to hear about your grandmother, Jason. There are sedatives and my understanding is anesthesia that works like that, where it's not taking away the painful experience, but it's in effect making the version of you, whether it's you or technically a different person after the fact, have no recollection of the painful experience. So then I think this means that when people have that happen to them and they're going in for surgery again, and they're getting anesthesia, they don't anticipate the pain which is a sort of test for personal identity. If you imagine some future version of you and you don't, you're not thinking of this as your own, you're just thinking of it as impartially bad. That's supposed to be evidence that you think it's not uh, actually you. I think what's happening is there's just, people are confused about personal identity because it's a very difficult issue and they're not anticipating the pain and they're unwittingly doing something that's very bad for themselves. I mean, it might be good overall, but they're going into an experience where that is going to be bad and they should fear it, even if they have no recollection of that. Uh, and if it's a different person, that just seems really much worse. The anesthesia case, I think is a problem for you, Travis, for your account. So on your account, a necessary feature of you being you is that the same physical structures in the brain are present in the two scenarios where we're asking, are those two scenarios instances of the same person? Now in, a, in the anesthesia case, it's very much the case that the physical structures change. So the anesthetic changes those physical structures so that they don't process consciousness the same way. So my understanding is that nowadays when they give you an anesthetic, most of the time they don't give you a painkiller. So there's a bit of the brain that seems to be experiencing pain or the same receptors are firing or the same neurons are firing, 
but the rest of the brain isn't receiving that signal. So it seems like what's happening in anesthesia is that there's all these different parts of the brain that are firing, but they're not firing coherently. So there's a noise that's interrupting the communication between those different parts. And that seems to be a fundamental change in structure. So on your view, you cease to exist under anesthesia. Is that correct? Maybe. I mean, I, th the structures might be different, but the, I think it is the same brain that persists throughout the process of anesthesia, even if the structures are different. So if the brain itself can continue to exist while there's changes in structures, then I think you survive anesthesia. But if not, then I would have to say that you cease to exist. But now hold on, then you're saying that a criterion for identity is the matter itself, not just the structure of that matter. Well, it's the persistence of the physical thing that gives rise to the conscious experience. And I think the structure is a part of what must, what, yeah. Stru structural changes can make the physical thing go in and out of existence. But filling out the details as to what sorts of structural changes a physical thing can withstand and which sorts of things they cannot, that's something that I'm not sure what to say. It's very puzzling. There might be no good answer for that, in which case I'd have to revise my view drastically. I'm going to do think like you. you can change some features of a statue and the statue will persist. But if you change enough of the structure, then it ceases to be the statue. And what sorts of structural changes it can withstand and which sorts of ones it cannot, I'm not sure. So let's push the case further. Suppose you die, physical, your physical body ceases, heart stops beating, you go in the ground, and then in a thousand years time, God resurrects you. Yeah. Could you persist in that new being on your view? So the structures degrade, there's no continuity, there's no physical continuity at all. But there is similarity because late your another brain or another body is built up by God that looks just like yours now before you died. On your yeah. view, you wouldn't persist. Is that right? Because so you don't my, continue. My brain is completely deteriorated. It's it rots. Yeah, it away. rots. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. So what are the atoms that make up the new is completely distinct atoms that give rise to the same conscious experiences that I had at the moment of death? So is your position that if they were the same atoms, then there could be continuity and if they're not, then there couldn't be. Yeah. I think that's the way I want to go. Now then I'd have to say that you could have me multiply instantiated. If you take God takes the atoms that made me up seven years before my death and the atoms that made me up at my death and then instantiated those, then I would have to say that I would. Uh, being sensated in different places. And that's very weird. And that seems analogous to the sort of vision case too, where I then would want to say that those two post-resurrected people are distinct from one another, but I'd want to say that they each seem identical to me. And that seems to violate a very plausible rule of logic, transitivity. <laughs> it's okay. if I'm identical to resurrected me seven years before my death, and I'm identical to resurrected me at the moment of death but they're not identical to each other, then I have to give up transitivity. That seems bad. I don't want to do that. <laughs> so maybe I'd have to say it wouldn't be me and whatever God would resurrect would be a clone version of me, or I'd have to say it would have to be the cells that make uh, of my brain at the time of my death. And if it's completely different cells, then I think it's not me. It's in effect just a clone. So it seems like the difficulty in your position is that you've got two pillars. The one is about structure and the one is about the same physical matter. And it's unclear whether you need both or one is sufficient. So if it's the same identical atoms, then you have to say, well, I die every seven years. And your way of getting around that is to say, well, no, the structure kind of remains the same. So because there's the slow replacement over time, there's continuity. So I, I wonder if you have to pick a line or not. Yeah, why do I have to put it like, yeah, I say that's right. It's the slow continuity is enough to preserve the structures that need to be preserved in order for personal identity to be maintained. So what seems, I suppose, a little counterintuitive about that is the, some people think you could survive if we could take all of your memories, all the stuff that makes you, and we put it into some non-biological being. So we put you into like an Android and that thing behaves in, a, in exactly the same way as all the same beliefs, hopes, desires, but shares none of the physicality. You're going to say, well, if you 
replaced it one atom at a time and I slowly, I start off like a biohuman and then I turn into the android. Yeah, then I survived. But if we, you know, flip the switch and take the consciousness out and stick it in the, in the machine, I'm the ghost of the machine, then I died. And that seems arbitrary. Yeah. I and mean, you sort of alluded to it earlier with your silicone case. Right. Yeah, it does. Very weird. Seems arbitrary. If you have an account of personal identity that seems less arbitrary and less weird, I'm all ears. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I fully admit that like, that's a very serious problem. And I, this is just a limit of my own philosophical abilities, but I'm not aware of an alternative account that avoids all of those problems. I have another case to think about, which is someone who, let's say, does have dementia. Uh, and so they slowly degrade into mush. Do you think that they die? while their physical body persists. So they, their memories disappear, their character traits change, all that stuff. Not as long as they have conscious experiences that their brain gives rise to, that I think they're one of the same person. But this is what I think is a problem for like Jason's view and other views of personal identity. So presumably Jason thinks that they cease to exist as they deteriorate. And then imagine that they're able to take a medication that revitalizes the brain and that same brain gets the memories back. And I mean, that's a science fiction case, but the John Lydon case, I think is a real case that doesn't involve dementia, where it seems to me like Jason has to say, John Lydon pre-coma and John Lydon immediate post-coma before they have the memories back are different people. But then John Lydon post-coma is the same physical being with psychological continuity and consistency of character that gets the memories back. So then I. I think Jason is going to have to say that John Lydon immediate post coma and John Lydon post coma with the memories are the same individual, but you, then you have to violate transitivity. And I don't want to give up transitivity as a criterion of personal identity. That, that seems like a cost to me. Yeah. So I want to say that pre coma, during coma, post coma are three different individuals. And then fourth individual, when everything is reintegrated is not the same as the first individual. So there's four, not three. So if I understand there's, there's pre-coma, so everything's going swimmingly, then there's accident, then there's coma. So I want to say that second person, third person is person who wakes up just after coma, but, but doesn't yet remember the memories of the first person. And then there's fourth person who suddenly remembers everything. And yeah. the question is how many are there? Are the four identical? Are the four all distinct from each other? Are there three or four? On my view, there's four. And they're all distinct. So you think four is different from three. Once, once he regains the memories, then the third person that existed before the memories ceases to exist. Well, well, four remembers three, three's yeah. memory, but three, right. three doesn't remember a lot of what four remembers because four remembers one yeah. and three doesn't. Yeah. So do you think four is three, but three is not four? Yes. Yeah. And okay. Right. So that's, that not only violates transitivity, but it's this asymmetric account of personal identity, which I mean, again, like you know, Ted Sider has a really great paper in the journal of the American philosophical association defending asymmetric identity. And he's far more intelligent and accomplished a philosopher than me knows far more about personal identity. So like really smart people believe it, but I personally have a hard time believing in asymmetric identity. I don't want to give up these basic axioms of logic of transitivity. And if A equals B, then I also think B equals A. And if you accept personal identity and classical logic, I think you have to give that up. So th those seem like costs of the view that seem to me like bigger costs than the cost of my view, which is gradual change allows you to persist, but immediate change that results in the exact same outcome is death for you. That's weird, but it seems less weird than giving up transitivity or that A equals B than B equals A. I'm prepared to go down that rabbit hole, but I, I should just say, I don't have to go down that rabbit hole because I could say four isn't three and three isn't four. Why? Because I'm sure there'll be big personality changes between three and four. And that might be sufficient for me to say they're not the same person. Yeah. I thought that's where we were going to go. But then like, if I recover some memory from my uh, childhood, does that mean that I turn into a different person? Right. Say I, I go back to Arizona where I'm originally from annually, but suppose I didn't. And then I go back after like a decade or something. And I like do a little tour of all of the places that I used to hang out with in Tempe. And it brings back all of these memories that I've completely forgotten very quickly. And that sort of changes my dispositions. And I like reminisce and I 
change the music that I listen to while I'm there and the restaurants that I go to and so forth. Are, then if you go that route, it seems like you have to say, I turn into a different person when I do that. That seems just as counter to me. Yeah, I'm going to have to draw the line somewhere. So s some amount of psychological dissimilarity is going to be sufficient to say it's a new person. And I'm going to have to stick on that line. The alternative is to say, well, there's no line. Psychological similarity is irrelevant. All that matters is physical continuity. And then you're going to suffer a whole bunch of other problematic cases. Yeah, personal identity might be one of these philosophical problems that's truly intractable because it can't be explained in more basic terms. So the best that we can do is give various sorts of cases and have these sort of heuristics that we use to test our judgments in these cases. But it's just going to come down to like a sort of fundamental class of intuitions thinking about all the consequences and weighing all the bullets against one another and trying to figure out what the smallest, least weird bullet is to bite.